hi everyone. We thank you for joining us today for the eHazard webinar via Safety and Health. I want to let you know as you file in, we're going to get things going in about another minute, but you are in the right place and we thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, again, we thank you for joining us today for the eHazard webinar. Wanna let you know, uh, just as you file in, gonna get things going in about another 30 seconds. Just wanna allow a few more people to get up and running as, uh, as the chat room opens. Hello everyone and welcome to today's safety and health webcast, Human Error, Preventing Electrical Safety Problems Through Proper Training and Job Planning, sponsored by eHazard. My name is Kevin Drewley. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine and will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well. In a few minutes, we'll start our presentation, but first let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speaker. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Derek Bixtel. Derek is a licensed ma master electrician who serves as an electrical safety consultant and trainer for eHazard. He also co-hosts Plugged Into Safety, an eHazard podcast covering electrical safety that is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Derek's previous experience includes work as senior electrical safety specialist for the National Fire Protection Association and subject matter expert for multiple industry organizations focused on electrical safety. Derek, we thank you for being here today. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you, and, and welcome everybody, and, and welcome to this presentation on uh, how we can try to prevent some common issues and problems that pop up uh, around the around the idea of human error, or or more appropriately coined term, human performance. Uh, <clears throat> now, I do want to pause for a second to also say that we've been sponsored as well by uh, by Bulwark. They've helped us put this put together. Uh, this presentation. So I want to say a special thanks to them as well. And uh, with that, we're going to jump right into it. All right. So one thing we we often get questions about is around because when we do a lot of things like uh, safety audits and, and, and uh, consulting on building an electrical safety program and things like that, we get the question around what is this human error slash human performance thing uh, and and what are we going to do about it? So we're going to kind of kind of try and cover uh, some of that today. We're also going to talk about why this concept is so important. Uh, what are some of the numbers and things that are, we're still seeing happen? We got some some newer numbers on statistics that have just uh, reports have recently come out. So we'll talk about those. I uh, will look about around how the standards uh, can help us deal with these uh, with these human performance issues as well. And, and so one thing I do have pulled up is I have, uh, I have the NFPA 70E uh, pulled up on my NFPA link platform on the background. So I'll be jumping back and forth um, into Annex Q, looking at some of the humans per, human performance requirements from inside the document as well uh, throughout, the, throughout the presentation. So um, now I will apologize ahead of, schedule, ahead of time if, uh, if I pull it up and, and the, you know, maybe the screen we're watching on is a little tough for it to read, but um, the, the point is we'll be able to kind of look at how some of the standards help us around that. Uh, and then 
then we're going to look at what we can do about it. How can we tackle how can we tackle these issues through items like training of employees? How can we tackle these uh, human performance issues through things like job planning and risk assessment procedures? Uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of look at some tools that we can add to the job safety plans or that job planning procedures so that we can try and start to identify uh, when we have situations that, that are sort of what we, well, what we call in, in Annex Q as being error precursors, so basically meaning that we have a situation that exists uh, in, in that task that is, um, that is, is indicative of the fact that potentially somebody is going to make a mistake. And then what can we do about it to try and minimize uh, the impact that that, uh, that that potential condition might have on the work being performed? All right, so human performance is simply, I mean, well, I shouldn't say simply, but human performance is actually spelled out in Annex Q as being an aspect of risk management that addresses organizational leader and individual performance as factors that either lead to or prevent errors and their events. Uh, the objective of human performance is to identify and address human error and its negative consequences on people, programs, processes, the work environment, an organization or equipment. Whew, that's a mouthful to read. Um, but uh, so simply put, what we're talking about here is in, in how the human factor uh, plays into what it is we're, we're dealing with on the job site, right? Um, because we can, we, can, we can write the best well-intentioned standards, we can put out the right electrical safety programs, we can, we can provide all the necessary lockout tagouts and, and PPE that everyone needs. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that there is still one variable that we just simply can't change in all of this. And that is the fact that the people who are doing the work are human, okay? And it is, it is a fact of nature that humans are not machines. I mean, we make mistakes. Uh, that was one way we, we learn uh, how how to do what we do. I mean, we learn through making mistakes. I mean, even from very, very young age, you touch the hot stove, you get burned, you realize, hey, that's something I probably shouldn't touch again. Uh, the problem is, is when we're dealing with electrical hazards, um, we get into uh, situations where uh, the, the, you know, you, you touch that hot oven and get a burn, you typically walk away from that. If, we're, if it's something that's an electrical hazard and we, we bump into an electrical hazard, we get shocked, we may not walk away from that one. Or if there's an arc flash, we may not be walking away from that. Um, so we are human, we make mistakes, we need to deal with it. Okay? Uh, it also is based on the concept that performance, human performance can be influenced. Okay? The way we make decisions can change. Things like, uh, time constraints and pressure from, from people who are asking us to do the work, um, cultural uh, issues with, with uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a master electrician uh, by trade. I mean, I came up through the electrical apprenticeship in the Minneapolis area, and, and we definitely had a certain culture in that time frame when I came through around what it meant to be an electrician. And that for a lot of times it meant you know, you weren't a real electrician unless you were willing to work on energized circuits. Uh, but the our performance and our decision making process can be influenced by a number of different factors um, that we need to we need to address. Uh, and then also we can tr we can start to to try and predict uh, when we have situations. Not necessarily we can't necessarily predict that this is an imminent hazard 100%. However. We can predict that we have all the building pieces in place and correct so that we can we can take additional measures to make sure that we we are mitigating those those uh, potential error likely situations as best as possible. So keep in mind that the human error stuff is predictable, it is manageable, and it is preventable and avoidable. Okay? And so that we're going to talk about uh, some of the ways that we can try and, and, and steer clear of this stuff. Okay, so we need to look at, uh, there's different stages of processing information um, that we're going to get into. And, and it talks about all this stuff back in, in Annex Q of NFBA 70E. 
uh, which is which was put together by the 70E committee. Had a lot of information um, that uh, you know human performance is a pretty pretty big. Uh, area of study with our friends north of the border for the CSA group. Uh, and so a lot of those folks who are in, uh, in, instrumental in, in helping with the 70E develop, NFPA 70E development have also brought those same rules down here and brought it into, brought it into 70E. And, and so we have that Annex Q, which is a phenomenal. It's actually, uh, as far as code books go, if you get a chance, open up a copy of 70E and read Annex Q because it doesn't read like your normal sort of, of, of part of the code book or part of a code book or, or standard book. Um, it does talk a lot about kind of basic what this human performance model is based on. Um, and so it gets into things like this, like I said, this different stages of information processing. Right? You guys right now, you're listening to me speak across the computer and doing this webinar. Uh, you're in full on attention mode. So you are trying to process the information uh, that, as it comes by, by focusing on what I'm talking about and, and what's coming through the speakers on your computer. Uh, but we also get into processing information through things like uh, sensing it. So being able, you know, touching that stove's hot because I touched it and it, it's hot, things like that. Um, and I also want to, uh, there's also other types of information processes where we might get one piece of information and we have to decipher what that means to then make the best decision. So that's going to be kind of in encoding the information and thinking about what the, what the next uh, step might be. And then there's the, the stage of info processing where we get, we, we take the information in and it's a sort of a, an auto, automatic uh, response to it. And it's, it's sort of because we've trained at this enough times that when this happens, this is the response. Um, I'm a, my, my son who just graduated or is graduating, about to graduate high school, just finished his senior year of wrestling. Wrestlers, and I'll, I'll reference wrestling, the wrestling community quite a bit throughout the presentation, but ref, wrestlers are great at immediate responses to adverse situations because they train to make it almost muscle memory that if 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 my opponent puts a hand on a certain part of my body i almost instantly instinctively know here's what i'm going to do and this is my response so they reach out and grab my leg to get me a takedown i instantly go into a sprawl uh, they put a hand on the back of my neck i instantly look shoulder down pull, pull the hand off because it's muscle memory and i've trained to make it uh, almost instantaneous. So my response time is much, much quicker. Okay? Uh, and that's what we're trying, that's what we're talking about getting to when it's in the retrieval and action kind of standpoint. However, what we need to understand is that this attention resource pool is very shallow. Uh, we can only do so much. And then through my years as an instructor in, in the apprenticeship program uh, in Minneapolis, uh, one of the things that they taught us there is that at best, uh, if somebody's just plans on focusing on the words you say, uh, at best, we're looking at maybe 20 to 25 percent uh, retention rate on what information was was transmitted. So, um, you know, it, it's a lot of times when we start getting into this idea of will a human being make a mistake in a given situation? And, and we we come in after the fact and it's like, well, how did he get hurt? They went through the job planning procedure. He was aware of what the plan was. Yeah, but it might not be enough just to just to listen to what the job plan is because there's only so much that they can retain. We're obviously bound to uh, make mistakes and we're going to miss things and things like that. So there's certain tools that we can use to try and, and minimize or in, minimize that chance of that happening by increasing the amount of information that is retained prior to going and doing the work. So there are critical points okay, in the work that we do where the risk that we are doing is going to be increased. And it's just going to, it's going to require uh, more of our attention. And every time that we do more, we, we dump more attention onto one specific thing, it takes attention away from a from another area, and a great example of this is that there's a uh, I'm not sure exactly what institute put it out, but I, I watched this on a 
um, I think a, a, a TV show about how the brain works. And they had a video where they asked you to watch the individual in the middle of the screen bouncing the basketball. And they asked you to count how many times the basketball bounced. And at the end of the video, if you guessed right, you were gonna get some sort of prize. Uh, and so you know, I became very focused on the basketball and looking at how many times that basketball hit the floor and trying to count the, the times I heard it go ping off the floor, you know, the sound of basketball makes. Um, and at the end, I guessed the answer and I got it right. And I was super pumped about myself. I thought I was doing awesome. Uh, and then they come in and they said, oh, but did you notice the, the actor in, dressed in a gorilla suit that came dancing on the screen and did the Macarena and then danced off the screen? And I was so intensely focused on counting the number of times the basketball was dribbled. I, I did not, 100% did not see the, the six foot tall gorilla dance his way onto the screen uh, and dance around while the, the individual is bouncing the basketball. And so what we need to keep in mind is that kind of thing can, it can very much happen when we're dealing with working around electrical hazards. So especially when we know the task that we're doing is extremely dangerous and we can be so intensely focused on the work that we have in front of us that we miss other things. And it's that other, those other things that can get us hurt. And we, we miss the fact that, you know, the job site isn't set up right. We miss the fact that there's a loose conductor over here to the side. We miss the fact that an overhead conductor has gotten too close to us because we're so intensely focused on what we had doing um, that we miss what's going on around us. And, and, and that's because, again, like I said, that, that, that attentional resource pool is not the, it doesn't have the biggest deep end. And, but there are some things that we can do to improve, um, to improve the way we pay attention within, within that situation. And, and we, can, we can start to, to mitigate these dangers uh, because, uh, because we've taken certain steps through training, job planning, risk assessment, things like that. All right, so when we look at the number of people getting hurt, and, and this kind of speaks to, to uh, you know, what we're still looking at. We, we look at, uh, when we first started talking about this electrical safety stuff, um, well, it's been around for a while, but uh, we really started pushing 70E in the mid to late 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, and so we started to see the number of, of fatalities from electricity uh, really, beginning to come down ex extensively. But however, when we got to about 2009, 2012, it kind of plateaued. Uh, and so we, we've really, whoops, sorry, we really flattened out here uh, since 2009. And we've been sticking around in that uh, 150 uh, to two, in between 150 and 200 kind of range, it, it's give or take. Uh, in there, and and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, you know, the work outlook picture certainly plays into it, um, but then there's also a lot going on with the fact that you know, people aren't still aren't necessarily 100% where we need to be from an electrical safety uh, risk management standpoint. Uh, and pretty much every facility I've I've gone into over the last you know six or seven years. We're still having conversations around the idea of job planning, the ideas of risk assessments, and what does that entail, and, and things like this. So we still have a very long way to go, but I, hopefully there's some, some, some tips and tricks that we can get to so we can start to see that plateau kind of break through and start to come back down uh, again and get to, a, get to a situation. I know, hopefully, I, I, idealistically, and call me a dreamer if you want, but idealistically, I want to get to a year, just one year at least, uh, where we get that fatalities from electricity down to a zero. Um, that would really just be the feather in my cap at the end of my career, or maybe it doesn't have to wait till the end of my career. Hopefully we can do it sooner rather than later. But um, if we can get to a zero, that would be fantastic. Uh, because a lot of these accidents are things that, uh, that can be prevented. Um, they can, we can, we can, recognize when the situation exists for a potential incident, uh, and then we can take the necessary steps to, uh, to mitigate those risks. Now, when we look at who's getting hurt as well, we start to sit, kind of see a picture of 
where we're dealing with people who are in the in that risky category. Um, so you know, when I and I always uh, kind of liken this to the uh, kind of how much years you have into it, right? Uh, because when we start out at the beginning, somebody we either we're coming out of school or or, or we're just getting into the workplace and somebody has told us in an orientation video that, hey, this stuff hurts and it's going to hurt the entire time you're kill it's killing you. So you want to be careful around it. And so, you know, we take different, we follow the rules, we do certain things, we make sure we're not, we're not crossing boundaries and things like that. However, if something happens, we work around this stuff long enough. Uh, so we start to become comfortable around it. We start to become complacent. And I know I fit right into that bill 100% myself. Uh, and, and one of the very first jobs I was ever on was a, a remodel of an elementary school uh, where that because the teachers really didn't understand how, how computers worked at that time, they were under the assumption if we shut circuits off, that it, they would lose all their data saved on the computer and they would lose their lesson plans and all that stuff. So they wrote it into the job specifications that we had to do the entire remodel of the school without de-energizing a single circuit. Um, so, I mean, obviously that sounds really ridiculous by today's standards. However, back then they were confident enough that it was okay to do that. They, they put it in writing in the job specs. And so I spent the first eight months of my career as an electrician working on energized 480, 277 volt circuits and 120, 208 volt circuits. That was just commonplace. So in there, I got to become really comfortable working with energized branch circuit conductors. Uh, and so that began to sort of play into the complacency side of things. And I started to just kind of lose the attention to the safety aspect. And, and I started to, to put that into the back on the back burner, because one thing we got to realize is the more we do something, the less, uh, the less our focus on the task at hand becomes. And we start thinking about other things. And I know uh, I have a note. I could fill. I could fill the whole hour with my examples of things that I probably didn't do the right way. Um, but now I would like to say I've gotten to a point in my career where I, I am. I am firmly and solidly standing on the survivor's ground. Of course, I. I am happy to report I'm not in the 55 plus range yet. I'm not even close to it. But I've gotten through the through the uh, part of my career where. I was taking risks and I was taking chances and I was doing things uh, that were that were dangerous because because I wasn't focusing on what it is that I need to do. And, and that's that sort of cowboy stage of the career where where, you know, we were taking risks. We weren't paying attention to what we were doing. Um, our focus was on other things and we were really setting ourselves up for potential uh, potential injuries. Now. When we look at how the standards apply here, of course, the, the big ones that apply to, to what we have to do to stay, to stay safe on the job site, uh, OSHA, whether it's subpart S, subpart K, uh, they're gonna kind of give us that what we have to do. Uh, 70E is gonna follow that up and, and, and CSA uh, Z462 up in Canada, they're gonna follow that up with giving us work practices for how to comply with, with the overall, um, the overall sort of directive from the OSHA documents. But the main thing, what OSHA is going to state is that we have to turn the power off. We have to work in a de-energized state unless we can prove that, that uh, there's a very good reason not to. And they're really only the very good reasons to work energized that OSHA allows for is that either because it's infeasible or, or it is, uh, it, it's more dangerous to turn the power off than to leave it on. And so for the most part, our, how, we're going to, how we're going to mitigate the human error piece of it is by, by removing the hazard. And so when we, look at, when we look at how turning the power off, or well, it's more than turning the power off, but in, in 70E, we, we define this term called establishing an electrically safe work condition. And that electrically safe work condition is we've de-energized the equipment, we've locked it out in accordance with established standards, and we've verified it's in a zero energy state. And if there's reason to, we'll apply temporary protective grounds to protect the employee. And, and so that's how way 70 East priority is for meeting what the OSHA standard is. And that, so we're gonna consider that in 70 E as being hazard elimination. Well, if we've taken the hazard out of the equation, 
it becomes very easy for the employee to work on that equipment and not get hurt. And, and this human performance stuff becomes a little bit less of an, an issue. Okay? Where we're really looking at those, when we're working, where we're exposed to the hazards. Now, either because it's an infeasibility piece, so I have to, for what I have to do, I need the power on to do the task I'm doing, or the equipment I'm working on is, is set up such that we can't, uh, we can't de-energize it. Uh, something like PD systems or, or uh, you know, maybe large energy storage systems might be something where you can't totally de-energize the, the equipment that we're going to work on. Uh, so we're going to do that in an energized state. Or there's the other option that they give us in 70E and OSHA, and that is the whole idea that it, it, de-energization would create some sort of additional hazard or increased risk. And so that is creating a situation where it is more dangerous to turn the power off than to simply leave it on. Okay, uh, but the the number of times that that happens these days are are much much more fewer and far between. Uh, and then we have some other standards that are going to come into play as well: IEEE ASTM standard. And these are all going to, if we're following this, they're going to they're all going to give us information that helps us put our best foot forward when it comes to doing the work safely. Now, again, OSHA states that we have to create a, a workplace that is free from known and recognized hazards. Uh, they really kind of tell us that by the first thing we're going to do is shutting the power off, right? But OSHA isn't really the, the they're, they're kind of more high level performance based. This is what we have to do, not necessarily the how we do it. Uh, and that's where the, the standards like 70E and 462 come into play uh, because they start to develop what it is that, that we need to. To put in place to be able to meet those those requirements of the OSHA standards. So 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 looking at 70E, that's going to detail what kind of training we need to to provide our employees, what kind of planning they need to do, risk assessment procedures, establishing an electrically safe work condition. Okay, and then we're also going to give additional helpful information like we find in the annexes. So when we go to annex specifically to annex Q and take a look at what it requires, okay, so, or it doesn't, sorry, an, let me back up. Annex Q doesn't require anything because it's an informative annex, okay, but it, it goes into a whole piece about what is human performance and the potential for how it may have an effect on, on people making mistakes and getting hurt. So it's human performance and workplace electrical safety. So like I said, this is a fantastic read. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and read it to you just because we don't simply have enough time uh, in the program for me to sit and read through everything that's that's in this. If you have your own copy of NFPA 70E uh, or a subscription to NFPA link like I'm showing here, um, by by all means, I highly recommend that you you get out there and 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 uh, and get into Annex Q, especially if you're in the role of of implementing an electrical safety program or implementing employee training within the job site. Uh, things like that. Uh, but that's going to really give us some some starting points. Now we do have to um, we do have to adapt that to what it is that that we do. And we'll go back to Annex Q. So so if I switched off the screen and you're like, hang on a second, I wanted to see what it said. Uh, we'll go back there because there is a table back in Annex Q that I want to I want to touch on uh, because it's a it's a procedure, it's 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 an Sorry, it's a resource that we can add into our job planning procedure uh, that really helps us. Um, that really helps us up the level of safety and uh, or up the level of uh, yeah, up the level of of safety from electrical hazards or all hazards in general, really. But it helps us to kind of predict when those conditions exist for people to make mistakes. Now, 70E is going to require that we provide a certain level of training to everyone that's going to walk onto the job site, whether we're an unqualified person, whether we're management, whether we're the most senior electrically qualified individual in the company, uh, we have to have some sort of level of training uh, that is within the, the or within, or that's, that's appropriate, sorry, to the, um, to the, the hazards that we're exposed, the level of hazards and risks that we're exposed to. So we need to have some level of training um, that, that helps us to be able to respond to that. 
And so when we think about the idea of qualified within 70E, that's really where the different levels of training that we need to have are going to be based on what level of qualification our employer is going to put us in. And, and so when we start looking at the people who are the more senior electrically qualified individuals who a company maybe will say, hey, we put our full faith and trust in you to go out there and do, uh, do electrical work that exposes you to these hazards. And you've demonstrated to us that you know the equipment we're working with, you know the safety related work practices, you've taken the training, you can demonstrate you know how to do the right things and make the right decisions. Um, so now we're gonna bake into that training as well, uh, as much as we can to try and make this stuff almost second nature. So think about, think about uh, just a, a great example of this is, um, think about if we have a, a situation like seatbelts, okay? Um, when we first get our license, or at least when I first got my license back in the day, there was no seatbelt laws or anything like that. Um, and so, I mean, obviously during driver's ed, they, they taught us, hey, it's a good idea to wear your seatbelt, but they couldn't make you do it. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't mandatory. In fact, actually, we even got to take our behind the wheel and seatbelts was optional. Um, but uh, so then when, when they passed the law, we, a lot of us started finding out the hard way that uh, it cost a lot of money if we got caught driving without our seatbelt on. Uh, and so we started, we started to wear our seatbelt every time and all the time until we got into a habit of doing it. Uh, and now when we approach electrical safety training, that's the way I like to approach things is how can we, how can we train people on these safety related work practices so that when they go out onto the job site, when they go out and to actually do the work where they're exposed to the hazard, the requirements we talked about are a habit because they're, they're, in the, they're, in the, they're in the process of doing it every time, all the time. Uh, and it puts it, on, puts it into kind of almost a, a autopilot mode. And so that's one of the things that we need to do. And again, we're gonna do that based on what level of hazard that the individuals are exposed to. And so, you know, when I think of somebody, maybe that not the senior most qualified electrical person uh, that there is, but somebody that's more say task qualified. Um, now what we'll look at for them is to say, how can we, how can we try and put things on autopilot so we, we minimize the chance that that task qualified person uh, is, is not so much, uh, not so much exposed to the hazards that they're going to be, that, that exist with the work that they're looking at okay? and, and try and minimize their, try and minimize their exposure to risk based on the, what it is that they're doing. And of course, within a facility, you have to define what that is because we need to define exactly what, what it is that the individual is going to be doing and what level of risk there is and stuff like that. But we, we can look at that in here in just a second when we get to the, uh, when we get to that kind of sort of job planning stage. And, and, and again, this, the idea of qualifications within 70E kind of comes back to, it's, it is almost all a task-based conversation. And, and so making sure we use qualified persons for everything that we do is going to be one of the, one of the most important things that we can do to potentially eliminate the chance of human error being made. And again, that is just to reiterate it, it's somebody who has demonstrated the skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and, and has received safety training to identify the hazards and reduce the associated risk. And that is really, that last part of that definition is the crux of all of this, is to, um, to reduce the associated risk that we're gonna be exposed to. And based on what we're doing, being qualified means that we know how to reduce the risk. And part of that's going to come along with how do we mitigate the chance that the, uh, that human performance plays into this issue. Now, as a qualified person, we need to be trained in special precautionary techniques and, and, and items like that, proper use of PPE, proper use of insulating tools uh, and equipment. But we also need to be trained in how to, uh, how to recognize the fact that we have potential for, um, for human error. And we have the potential, in fact, actually 70E states that electrical an employer's electrical safety program needs to promote self-awareness and self-discipline. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we do it 
by training our qualified persons to incorporate that stuff into the job safety planning process. A lot of times when I go on site, their job safety plan simply only recognizes, okay, what is it we're doing? Um, are, we, are we going to be exposed to, to hazards? And if we are, what are those hazards? And what are we gonna do about them? And a lot of job safety plans don't ask questions like, are there any identified human error, pre or error precursors or human performance issues? You know, is there a time constraint? Is there time pressure? Is, is there, uh, was the individual out late last night? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff is, is all questions we need to ask before the individual is standing in front of a dangerous situation, right? Um, because it's all going to, all of that stuff is going to have an effect on their ability to make the right choices. Now, when we go look at the, if you go into Annex Q and look at some of the human performance stuff, um, we'll see that there's really kind of basically three modes that human performance is going to be based on. There's a rules-based human performance mode, uh, and that really is more of a, a kind of an if-then logic. So if this happens, then I respond with this. Uh, this is kind of usually the, it's, it's kind of the, the most optimal type of human performance mode to get into uh, because it, it, it gets us to a stage where we respond quickly. This is that the, the wrestler mentality, right? So if my opponent puts his hand here, then I do this. And it, it puts it on autopilot. So if this happens, this is my response. Now, where we're going to see the most chance for error around that performance mode is going to become in a, come in. Um, it's going to come in the form of uh, something like a misinterpretation of the first stage. So, you know, my input, I misinterpret what that means, and I respond to it incorrectly. That tends to be where the errors happen in in the rules based performance mode. Now, when we go to a knowledge-based performance mode, then this is relying on what it is that I know as a, as a person and how I can respond within certain situations. It, but in order to be able to do that appropriately, I need to, I need to really have a good picture of what it is that, that I'm uh, dealing with. And this often takes more time for me to be able to respond to it. And that's one thing that, that gets tricky when we have something like when we're doing electrical work, we may not have time necessarily to sit down and sketch out a picture and think about it accurately to make sure we have all our ducks in a row. Uh, that's something that should happen before the work has begun, not during the work, right? When we're doing the work, we should really be in that rules-based performance mode because we've, we've planned for things to go wrong. And when they do go wrong, we know how we're going to respond and we We've, we've talked about this and how it's going to go. So if this happens, then my response is this, and we, we've dealt with that. And, and then we also have uh, the skills-based performance. Now, this is the least effective performance mode, uh, in my opinion anyways, because um, it relies on the individual's skills, uh, but it has the potential to give them sort of a, a false sense of security because we can start to think we're better than we really are. Okay? This was where I played at in a lot of places uh, as an electrician, okay? because I spent so much time working with energized conductors. I thought my skills were at a level that uh, I was safe from this electricity stuff. Now I would say, you know, I just won't drop my wrench. And I sat in a number of safety classes with my arms folded and my feet up on the desk and the instructor saying, well, here's an individual who got blown up in an arc flash, got shocked and electrocuted, da 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 da, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and I sat back there in the back of the classroom and thought to myself, well, it, it really stinks for that person, but they made a mistake. I just won't make a mistake okay? because my skills are so good. So it leads to inattention and complacency and um, this sort of self inflated sense of ego that you can do this stuff. And that the idea of making a mistake is even off the table. Right? And so we want to stay away from that. So I, I like to always challenge everybody when we get in, when I get into a, a safety class uh, where I'm teaching electrical safety. I mean, I mean, obviously 70 is the backdrop, but we're really trying to teach and, and preach practical application of, of electrical safety in the workplace. 
Uh, and I always strive to say, hey, put yourself in a position where you can think about some things that you can create and habits. So we're doing it all the time, every time. And it gets it away from that sort of having to think about doing it and puts it into an almost an auto response or autopilot. So if this happens, then this is what I do. And, and that's going to help us with a lot of things. And we can train people to get there. Now, when we flip over on the other side to get to the job planning, now keep in mind that the job planning procedures are put in place in 70E as a way to help us identify uh, what we're doing, why we're doing it in a way that exposes us to hazards. Uh, what exactly are we doing? We scope out the work. We, we have detailed job descriptions of exactly the tasks that we're doing. Um, it's really there for us to identify what the potential problems are. Um, and so one thing I've seen done really nicely uh, when people are doing this from a human, uh, trying to add human performance into this uh, equation is that we'll see, we'll see questions starting to be asked around the job safety plan uh, for things like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is, is there any sort of, well, what they call an annex Q? Are there, have there been any error precursors identified? Time constraints, um, you know, the, the cloudiness, the, the culture at work, anything like that. Um, the, also, the other thing that I've seen is, is by establishing somebody that's deemed as this employee in charge to fill this job plan out, um, that's another benefit that can help as well because they can. This is somebody who is a qualified person who can understand well, why are these questions important to ask, ask at this planning point. Okay? And we can also work this into the energized electrical work permit. Of course, not all the time do we need to use an energized electrical work permit, uh, but if we do need it, that the, these kind of questions should be a part of that process. And that helps us to prepare for when things go south. So when things go wrong and, and now we have to react to something, we've identified what the potential problems are. And we recognize, for instance, that if, if we screw up and we drop our wrench, this could cause an arc flash in this equipment that we're working on. And if that's the case, then we should plan to react to a potential arc flash and put our plan in place. So we, we know what we're going to do in the event that it happens. because. Let me tell you this, after the fact that it's happened is not the time to figure out what your plan to respond to is going to be. At that point, we're gonna be trying to run around and, and uh, just simply survive after the incident has happened. And that's not when we need to be thinking about, uh, about what happened. So, so we can, we can kind of mitigate that by having that plan uh, addressed before that. Now, the other thing we wanna make sure we're identifying is, is for things like, is there repetitiveness to what we're doing? Uh, because that will oftentimes remove the focus from what we're working on uh, and, and put it somewhere else. And I think to, you know, in my own career, a number of times where, you know, I, I look back and there was a bunch of, you know, overly repetitive stuff. Well, at the beginning, I was thinking about what I was doing, but by the time I got to the, like the last circuit breaker being bolted into a panel board, on the job site, and I'd done hundreds already. I wasn't really thinking about bolting that last circuit breaker into that panel board. My mind was off somewhere about what I was going to either catch or shoot over the weekend. Um, you know, because I was a young, late early twenties male in 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 Minnesota, and and uh, we like to do things like that on the weekend. So I was thinking about it. my mind was off somewhere. Um, that way. So what I want to do is make sure that I'm I'm really kind of trying to think about this stuff. Now I did see a question just kind of popped in about the job plan needing to be documented. Uh, yes. So 70E is going to require that we that we document all this stuff. And this is this is where I'm trying to get to here with the with the human performance side of it because when we document this and we start to ask these questions about is the are the steps repetitive? Are there is there a time pressure constraint that we need to worry about? Is there a looming deadline that's, uh, that's important coming up? Uh, because then when we get to the stage of the job briefing, we can start to read it back to each other. And from an audit standpoint, when we start to audit the work that we're doing, this is gonna help us identify where we have these potential issues. So we can build a plan going forward to really start, start, uh, start to account for 
uh, account for the human error or human performance issues that, that pop up from time to time. Okay, and it helps us to incorporate sort of the lessons learned. Uh, but if we don't document the job plan, then it just kind of kind of goes by the wayside and all the good stuff we learn based on the planning for one specific task uh, tends to kind of be forgotten. So some ways we can, we can um, use the job planning stage to kind of help, help bring down the potential uh, impact of the human performance and human error uh, is, is there's some certain tools. So if we go into, now I'm gonna go back to 70E and I'm gonna go into that Annex Q again. And I want to look, there's a table, if I can get my mouse up here. Uh, there's a table in here that lists the error precursors. So this is table Q5 in the annex. So basically this is almost meant to be kind of a worksheet um, that we can fill out as a part or sort of an addition to the job uh, plan. And so it, it lists a number of error precursors in this table, things like time pressure, we're in a hurry, um, you know, the repetitive actions or monotony of the work being performed, things like that. And it has a, a list, sort of think of it as almost like a word bank for us to choose from of human performance tools uh, that it talks about in Annex Q, things like uh, using a, a job site review or pre-job briefing, using uh, post-job briefings, things like that. And so some of this stuff is going to work really effectively to help with some of the precursors. So when we look when we look at things like, um, like uh, distractions and interruptions as being an error precursor. So this, let's say there's a lot of stuff going around on the job site. Well, one of the effective tools that might, that might work to help with that, if we have the resource, we have multiple people on the site to do it, we might be able to come with three-way communication. So then when we come and look at what is exactly three-way communication, we start, we, we look at, I think I went the other way. Yeah, so three-way communication, we're gonna look at you know, setting up a way to, um, to message between uh, sort of somebody sending the directives to the individual doing the work and then that individual reading them back to them. Uh, it also goes along, the, goes along with something like the, the uh, procedure use and adherence tool. So something like a switching plan, if we have a very specific procedure we need to do this, it's a pretty common thing on when we get into the high voltage type work, you develop a step-by-step -step plan and you read it to the individual who's doing it and they repeat it to you. And until they've repeated it correctly, they don't proceed. So you have to give them the clearance to do the next step, okay? Uh, and we also set up this employee in charge role. And, and now while there's not necessarily a definition of an employee in charge, in 70E yet, um, it is something that, uh, that we should be establishing uh, as a role within the safety world so that they can, they can get to, to, set up, um, to set up the job plan, to set up the procedures that we're gonna follow and make sure everybody's sticking to that plan. Now, if we are working alone, okay, we, tell, we referenced always this method that we call the three fives, take five steps back, take five minutes to do the risk assessment so we're not rushing it, we're not pencil whipping it, and look for five additional hazards trying to get the bigger picture uh, of what we're exposed to. Now, when we go to the go back into the tools, uh, the, the human performance tools side of things, we look at something like that would be sort of the self-check and verbalization tool. So this is what we call the acronym STAR, or Stop, Think, and Act, uh, Stop, Think, Act, and Review, sorry. And that is basically, so if you're working by yourself, do the read and repeat method to yourself. And I, I, I was, my, well, my wife and kids make fun of me all the time for this because as I'm doing something, I'll sit there and, and almost be singing myself a tune uh, about the things that I'm going to do and the steps that I'm going to take. Uh, and A, it's just, it's just a weird habit I have, but B, uh, it, is, it is a tool that I developed because it helps me make sure that I'm staying in line in, in alignment with what it is I'm supposed to do. And so if we develop that stop, that, that self-verbalization and self-talk sort of mentality, because it's okay to talk to yourself. So Derek, Derek from E Hazard told you today that it's okay to talk to yourself. 
when you're doing the work um, and, and keep repeating to yourself the necessary steps you're supposed to take, okay? Now, during the risk assessment, um, the risk assessment is really defining some of the things that are important that we identify. So we're identifying whether or not a hazard exists. We're assessing what the risk is to the employee that's going to be performing the work uh, and then deciding what the appropriate risk control method is. So really human performance is going to, and, and the idea of human error is going to, going to fold into the parts, both where we're assessing the risks. So the likelihood of occurrence, uh, do we have an increased likelihood of somebody making a mistake is going to increase the likelihood or possibility of an event happening, okay? Uh, and then risk control methods, we're also going to put our performance tools into those risk control methods, okay? Can we develop a switching plan that helps us with the awareness and it helps us with the uh, administrative controls, especially if it's going to be a situation where we have to resort to wearing personal protective equipment um, for mitigation of the hazard, then we need, to, we need to also supplement that personal protective equipment with administrative controls and awareness. And that's things like what we talked about with the human performance uh, tools, like the self-talk and, and the switching plan and, and, and the pre-job briefing and, and things like that. Now, that risk assessment is going to help us establish the boundaries or the dangerous areas, okay? So, Inside those areas is where employees can be potentially exposed to the hazard. So that's where it's going to be the most critical that we implement those human performance tools. Okay? And so, so we, we start by asking ourselves, and, and this is specific to the arc flash risk assessment, uh, but we start by asking ourselves, you know, do we have that hazard that exists? So in that question, it, it lists we go to this table 130.5C and 70E and it lists a whole bunch of different things that we're doing. Okay? If we've identified that we have error precursors from human performance, we need, to, we need to heighten that level of, yeah, it's potential. If I have a potential to drop my wrench and cause an arc flash, and I also have identified during the job planning stage, that there's a significant amount of, of error precursors. Now I need, now I know that I have a heightened level of, of chance of getting hurt from this arc flash. And now is when I really should be taking some additional uh, steps to, to protect from that beyond just, well, let's throw my arc flash suit on and, and go do the work, okay? Now we have to actually say, okay, well, you know, Derek, had a, Derek had a bachelor party last night and, and now he's, he's maybe not the best guy to be doing this. We're gonna place, replace him with, uh, with somebody who uh, didn't go out and, and have a late night last night. Um, you know, those are all kind of things that we should be we should be addressing, uh, and we need to account. Sorry, we need to account for the human performance and possible human error in the risk assessment procedure, and it needs to be a part of the job plan. Okay. Um, now we can also do some things that help with the risk assessment and and the potential for error uh, from the onset. So. I know 70E requires that we install labels with the arc flash information uh, on equipment, certain pieces of equipment anyways, but I still go to a lot of facilities around the country that are missing labels and they don't have labels on their equipment and their employees look at me and say, how do I know what to protect myself from? Uh, well, we can, you know, that's one place, um, that's one place that we can improve the, the human performance factor because if we put risk assessment labels on our equipment already, it sort of starts to take the guesswork out of what, uh, what they need to do. Now, that is <clears throat> something, again, like I said, it's required by 70E. Uh, we need to review that information every five years to make sure it's up to date. You can increase that and improve that to say, review it on an annual basis or every three, three years. Uh, or we make sure we're documenting that we do that update every time we have any sort of major renovation or, or modification to the system. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about too is another way we can we can help bolster the human performance factor is that we we really work into the procedural side of things this idea of an energized electrical work permit. So a little bit of history, and I'll, I know we're we're coming up here on the end of the hour here, but uh, 
a little bit of history behind this permit is that it was really put into 70E as a way to make sure that we're, we're only doing, as it was a control method to put in to make sure we're only doing energized work when it's absolutely necessary and that is justified energized work. Uh, that's what it was, was put in there for. So now uh, there were some exceptions that came along with that because certain types of work are pretty much always going to be justified. So we gave them some exceptions. If an employer didn't want to use an energized electrical work permit, uh, because it was just kind of more generally accepted, justified energized work, things like voltage measurements and, and testings and troubleshooting and stuff like that. It's pretty hard to do with the power off sometimes. So we gave people an exception from the permit because of that. And so it was um, a lot of times they were taken to say, oh, well, we don't need a permit for that. But there's a lot of good information on this permit and we can we can use it even though the uh, even though the standard doesn't require we use it, we can use it from varying different degrees of uh, effectiveness. And so I've even seen programs where they use a permit, but based on the type of task that is being performed, that will dictate whether or not they need to uh, need to get a signature or anything like that. Um, so again, we can just make sure as we're, the more documentation and, and I get this standpoint, a lot of people say, well, these guys are pressed for time as it is already. We want them to stop and fill out a form uh, every time, and that's a little unrealistic. But really, when we start, when we stop and think about it, is 30 to 45 seconds, maybe maybe a couple minutes to fill out a fill out a form like an energized electrical work permit. Uh, is that really all that big of a consideration when you think about what the alternative is? And you start thinking about what what happens if somebody makes a mistake, and this is a step forward in the right direction. Uh, to minimize the chance we make those mistakes. And with that, that is the end of it. That's the end of the presentation. I know there's a ton of stuff to go over here in the human performance world. Um, yeah, I mean, there is just, a, there's a lot in, to unpack here. So I, I, I tried to do as, as best I can in an hour, uh, but there's just a lot going on. So with that, I'll take some questions. No, well, excellent and great job, Derek. We thank you for your, your insights and expertise as you indicate. Yeah. You did cover a lot of ground, and I know we in the attendees appreciate it. Um, before we do start, we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Before we do start that, though, just want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar, and your input is important because it does help us improve our future webcasts. Again, we're running a little low on time, but if you wish to ask a question, all you need to do is click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen type your question and click the send button and those questions that do go unanswered still will be forwarded along to Derek. Um, first question we have, Derek, um, do we have to have the procedure even though an external contractor is working in the company? Yes, absolutely. We do have a, um, so there is the idea within 70E of, of a host employer versus a contract employer. And that's because even though we aren't the contractor doing the work sometimes, um, we do still have the responsibility for safety of anyone that comes into the facility. Um, so, so even though uh, we know that, that somebody outside is going to be doing this, we should, still be, we should still be documenting the work being done. We should still have a good job plan and, and, and be holding on to that information uh, of anybody that comes onto site. Um, and so 70E is going to still require that we do develop that job plan um, for even contract work as well. So great question uh, is one that comes up quite a bit. Next one, uh, re referring back to, to 70E saying that under that uh, 110.5M indicates that auditing is required every three years and asks if you could please elaborate on what would constitute an audit. Oh. Well, I just, uh, in fact, actually before the webinar, I was just on a phone call about, about doing audits. Um, so, so the auditing, so there's a couple different types of auditing. So there's auditing of an electrical safety program, which is what 110.5M is indicating the audit needs to happen. Um, and that is really to make sure that the audit is, or the electrical safety program still in, in accordance with and in alignment with 70E, uh, looking at, uh, 
at that stuff to make sure that nothing in 70E has changed that would change the procedures we follow in the in the uh, in the book. Um, but then auditing also covers stuff like field work and making sure that our employees are still doing the right stuff and making the right decisions and 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 there's a whole auditing is a whole topic and maybe we could do maybe we could do a whole webinar on auditing uh, in and of itself in the future but um yeah auditing is basically one of the main controls that 70e puts into place to ensure things like the electrical safety program are still uh valid and and, and effective make sure our training is doing the job it's supposed to do uh, and make sure our job plans are doing that and that's again why we what's such an important reason for documenting um, the the job plans is so that when we get to the auditing stage that we have we have information about what what type of work was being done and what hazards we were exposed to and what we did about it yeah so it, it's sort of the way we learn from past past experience looks like we'll have time for one more question um, are power generation sites allowed to follow NESC rather than 70E? Ah, great question, Sandra. Um, yes. So actually, if you go into the scope of NFPA 70E, uh, it talks about what is covered and what's not covered. Uh, and in there, it mentions that, uh, that installations under the exclusive control of a utility uh, for the purpose of power generation, transmission, distribution, um, are are not covered within the document of 70E. However, if you go to something like on-site power production facilities, uh, and that's not a necessarily a, a public utility controlled um, aspect of things, they might they might install some of the equipment based on the NESC, but it is definitely a 70E um, 70E recovered installation however the the crux of that whole thing is that 70e is still technically a voluntary document document so basically the osha gives us the what we have to do that's that that um general duty clause we have to provide a workplace free from known or recognized hazards 70e is one way we can follow that you could draft you could not follow 70e at all and draft up your own electrical safety program um as, as long as it provides a level of safety that is equivalent to what 70E requires, you shouldn't be a, you shouldn't get in a problem with OSHA. Well, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time today. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Derek. Uh, once again, we do hope you take the time to fill out, fill out that evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. Uh, with that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Derek Vigstel, everyone at eHazard, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you.